How are you today? Well, we are starting a new four-week series called Join Up, where we're going to rally. It's a rally call saying, hey, let's, uh, as a church together, we're going to grow in certain areas. And, and it's going to culminate with the conference, the regional conference. We're hoping that, uh, that uh, those of you who have signed up are going to just experience God in, a, in an amazing way. Those of you who are not sure, maybe you've never been to a conference before, or you're kind of sorting through that stuff. It is my hope that over this next four weeks, in addition to growing us as a body in many ways, one of the things is to help you decide, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be part of this. And so we're going to be looking at that. Um, today we're going to be talking about faith because faith is the foundation of it all. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we, uh, pulls us together. It's, it's our focal point. It's how we grow. Most of us would like, how many of you would like to have more faith? Let me see. Yeah, most of us, would, that's including myself, most of us would like to have more faith. So we're going to talk about that. But you know, it is, it is something that is not a, so it's not an equation like a mathematical equation you solve. We are talking about something that is, um, that is uh, somewhat my- mysterious, right? There's a mystery part of it. And so we want to uh, go into it with a heart that is receptive, allowing God to work in and through us. And so to do that, I'd like to begin with prayer. So would you pray with me? Father, we just uh, right now ask uh, that you come and maybe if we have some facade that is keeping you at a distance, Lord, today uh, we want to uh, just drop our guard and say, God, speak to us, use us, grow us in those areas that you want to grow us in. Father, and I pray that you increase our faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said in Mark 9, 23, he said, everything is possible for the person who has what? Right. He says, the sky is the limit for those who have faith, who walk in faith, who get it. Um, Faith is a lot like a muscle. You know, you work a muscle, what happens? It gets bigger, it gets stronger. You ignore it, it atrophies. Faith is like that. When we use faith, we get more. We, it actually grows. When we don't, when we try to operate in our own or outside of uh, faith, then we weaken in that area. And so that some of you, 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 that's an area where you're saying, I could use some faith. And I want to kind of come alongside you today, uh, much like a personal trainer would. If you wanted to grow your physical muscle, you might get a trainer and say, okay, help me to get a plan. I want to give you a plan. I'm going to give you some things that you can, you can work through to grow your faith. We can do it together. You notice the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I certainly want to please God. If we want to please God, if we want God's favor, we want God's blessing on our lives, it's got to have faith. When we're facing challenges, you need faith. You don't need faith to worry. You don't need faith to get all bent out of shape and to get resentful and, and, to, uh, and to go sideways in your attitude. You do need faith, though, to please God and to have God's blessing and to see God work in your life in some great ways. And so we're going to look at these six stages of faith, basically how to grow my faith. Number one is I need to have a dream. It always begins with that. It begins with a dream, a, an idea, a vision, a goal, an ambition about yourself, about how God wants to use you, about how God wants to use you to bless other people. And there's many examples in the Bible of people that had great dreams. Noah had a great dream to build an ark, right? Abraham had a dream to uh, be a father of a great nation. Joseph had a dream to, uh, l- to save his people. Uh, David had a dream to build the temple. Ezra and Zerubbabel, they had a dream to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah had a dream to build a wall to protect Jerusalem. And so you see throughout scripture, people had these big dreams. And that's part of how our, God created you for a purpose. If you're alive today, you have a purpose. Part of your purpose, your dream will include that purpose. It'll include that, but they're not two separate things. You know, you don't have a dream and then a purpose and you're, well, I wonder how these fit. No, it doesn't work like that. You have a purpose that's part of the dream that God puts in your heart and puts in your mind. And so you operate out of that. How do you know it's a dream from God? Well, Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do far more than we would dare to ask 
or even dream of, circle that, dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, and hopes. So how do you know if a dream's from God and it's not just a, a pipe dream, it's not just something you thought, it's not bad lasagna from the night before? Well, the way you know is because you can't do it without God's help. You need God to come in and make it happen or it's not going to happen. If you could do it on your own, you wouldn't need faith. And you need faith to please God. It's part of the way God designed you just to do a, the dream he's put in your heart, which means it requires faith. So you need faith to do this great thing. In fact, the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. And so God is speaking to some of you. He's saying that thought, that dream, that, that, that thing that's stirring in you, God's saying that's for me. That's a dream I gave you. Maybe you've been kind of sorting through that and just kind of wondering, well, you know, and, and God says, I want you to wake up and live that dream. I want you to do that dream. Now, God will never give you a dream. Uh, his will always is in, is in alignment with his word, God's word. So that's part of another way we know this is from God because it won't contradict his word. His will won't contradict his word. I've had People say to me different things, like I had one guy say, you know, I, I'm going to leave, my, I have a dream to leave my family, my wife and my children, and to go, be, to, go to Hollywood and become a movie star. Well, that's, that contradicts God's, God's word. So that, well, that's not God's dream. That's your dream. And so part of the way we know it's God's dream is it, is it aligns with God's word and it's bigger than we can do ourselves. We need God's faith. We need the faith of God to help us with it. Number two, make a decision. See, for every 10 dreamers, there's only one that actually does anything about it. There's plenty of people that, that sit around and dream. But you got to actually make a decision to go for it. Say, I'm going to make this dream a reality in my life. It's not going to just, just remain on the shelf somewhere. I'm going to make it I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step toward that. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do the things I need to do to make it happen. I'm going to pray towards that. James says, you must believe and not doubt because a double-minded man is unstable in all that he does. Now, faith in the Bible is a verb. It's an action. It's not a noun. We use it as a noun. What faith are you? But the Bible, you don't see that. Bible, it's a verb. It's an action thing. It's something we do. We step out and we do it. And that's part of this decision part where we're acting in faith, and you're going to need to be involved in two things. One, you invest yourself, and then you let go of security. You invest yourself, because there's always an investment. There's always a price to be paid to realize a dream. The price will be time. It'll be money. It'll be reputation. It'll be energy. All of those things. Sometimes in significant ways. Where you lay down your reputation, people go, well, you're, kind of, you're kind of a nut, aren't you? You know? <laughs> That doesn't make any sense. And you take the plunge. You say, I'm going after this dream. And then you have to let go of security. You can't move on in the future and hold on to the past at the same time. Things that make you secure. Look at Abraham. Abraham had a, uh, a dream to be the father of a great nation. He had to leave his homeland and go to a place where he didn't even know what it was. Later he discovered it. We know it's the promised land and it's, we know it's Israel. But at the time he was just following God. He didn't even know. He let go of a lot of security there, his homeland. People he knew, security. Moses had security. He had a dream to lead the people of Israel out of 400 years of slavery. But he was in line for being the next Pharaoh. That's some bennies there. You know, he had good retirement, all of these great things. He had to be willing to let that go to go after the dream that God had for him. Nehemiah had a great job, job security, right there with the king. He was willing to leave that to follow what God had for him. If you want to walk on the water, you, you got to get out of the boat, right? You got to be willing to step out and say, you know what, there's some risk associated with this. Think of the uh, at the circus, the trapeze guys, you know, right? They're the trapeze, they're swinging, and they always leap from one of the bars to the next, you know, kind of do a flip maybe in between. Those bars never actually get close enough where they can grab them at the same time. They, for, for a moment, they're, they're airborne. They're just kind of hanging over there. 
And that's kind of what it is when you decide to step out and make a decision and go for your dream. You're, you're airborne. You go, well, you know, I had a dream to do this and you had this job and, and sometimes you're just in between jobs. I had somebody come up to me last week and said, you know, I've been praying for a new job and I got laid off last week. And I said, you know, your prayer has been half answered. Because <laughs> it's true, right? I mean, that was half of the prayer. God's in the process. And so sometimes it feels very awkward, very uncomfortable. Most of the time in real life, there's no net. And so it's very scary. But you got to let go of things that give you security if you're going to move forward. You got to make that investment as well. Number three, allow for a delay. It always happens. There's no uh, automatic, immediate stuff that's going on. It's not like God gives you that dream and boom, and it just happens. No, there's the decision to move forward, and then inevitably there's a delay. It's like, well, this is taking a while. You know, it's taking longer than I feel comfortable with. I don't like this, this time lapse. Habakkuk 2 3 says, let's read this out loud together. These things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. When you're in stage three, you're asking the when question. When's it going to happen? How long is this going to take? When am I going to get married? When will we have children? When will the children leave the home? (laughs) (laughs) That might be the stage we're in. <laughs> when the, this is when God, when when am I going to get healed? I've been I've been I've had this. When is so and so I care so much? You know my loved one. When are they going to get healed? And when you're just you, you're just in that place of delay, which is not easy. Most of us we don't like to wait, right? We don't like to wait in in, in grocery store lines. We don't like to wait in traffic. We don't even like to wait for our Christmas gifts. We don't like it. And yet, God enrolls us in this university of learning to wait. And some of you are on your way of getting an advanced degree at the university of learning to wait. You're learning how the delay sometimes is longer than we really feel comfortable with. And in the process, God is doing something, but we just rather have the dream happen. We don't, you know, we'll pass on the... the uh, the portion of character or the other things God wants to do in us. Noah had to learn how to wait. God gave him a dream to build an ark. You know how long he waited? From the time that God gave him the instructions about the ark till the first time it started raining? 120 years. That's a long wait. Obviously, they lived longer back then. I guess they didn't have so many pesticides in their food, radiation in there, all the kinds of things that, I guess, break our bodies down. But 120 years for Noah. Abraham had to wait a long time. God gave him the dream of being the father of a great nation. He didn't have a kid. He had to wait 99 years till his kid was born. That's a wait. That's a long wait. Moses had that dream of leading the people out of that were enslaved in Egypt, the Israelites. And he had to wait 40 years in the desert, in the wilderness, just 40 years till God was, okay, I'm ready now. That's a wait. David had to wait. He was anointed king, and then he waited years before he became king. Jesus, who was the Messiah, had that commission to be the Messiah, waited 30 years in a carpenter shop. We wait. Why do we wait? God teaches us. He teaches us to trust him. That's what God's doing. We're learning. That's part of that growing in faith. We're learning to trust in God, knowing that his timing is perfect. Delays never destroy God's purpose in our life. Sometimes we start to question that. You know, little kids, when sometimes they have a hard time getting the difference between no and not yet. And not yet, they interpret as no. But it's not no, it's not yet. Not yet may mean you wait until after dinner till you get your cookie. Not yet may mean you wait till you're 16 till you get a car. I mean, it depends on the circumstance of how long not yet is. And God is teaching us something during the not yets, whether it's just a short amount of delay or it's a long amount of delay. Now, the common reaction for us when we're in this delay is doubt, 
Right? We just start thinking, well, maybe I misheard. Maybe this isn't a dream from God. And we start to second guess ourselves. You know, maybe, maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. <clears throat> and it can get pretty scary and pretty dark in that tunnel of doubt. Like, you know, oh no. What? You know, there's a, a, a quote in, uh, in uh, Mark where Jesus is talking to somebody and the guy comes back to Jesus and he goes, help me in my unbelief. I, you know, he, has, he goes, I have faith, but help me in my, in my doubt, in my unbelief. And so sometimes that's our prayer. You know, I want to grow in faith. I'm trusting, I really do sense that this is God's dream and I've moved in decision. And in this delay though, help me God in my unbelief. How do you handle the waiting rooms of life? It can be pretty tough, but it reveals our faith. So we have the dream, we have the decision, the inevitable delay that happens. And then this fourth is we get to persevere through difficulties. See, we not only are blessed with the delay, but we get to, we get to have difficulties during our delay. Whoopee, right? We have difficulties that come and they come through circumstances. Just tough situations. Sometimes it comes through critics. Not everybody's on your side. Not everybody wants you to succeed. Reminds me of the guy who was a real wealthy guy. He had a pool in his backyard. He had a, a big crowd over for a party. In the pool, he had, he had like all these dangerous animals. Crocodiles, sharks, piranha. And kind of braggadociously, he goes, hey, listen, he's really wealthy. He goes, I'll give anybody $20,000 if you're willing to swim across this dangerous pool I have. Right then, he heard a splash. He looks over and some guy swimming across this dangerous, this dangerous pool. And he's swimming full on like a race boat across. He gets out and the guy's impressed. This rich guy he goes, that is amazing. I've never seen somebody do that. He goes, in fact, I'm going to increase it beyond the 20,000. Anything you want, what do you want? The guy goes, I want to know the name of the guy who pushed me in. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody's on our side. Sometimes you have critics. People that want to do you in. And you have... In the delay, you have those challenges. How do I get through this? Now, you know, it's people telling you that's, you know, people, in-laws, friends, you, you quit your job to pursue something, they go, that was dumb. You gave up all your retirement. You know, when Sharon and I started this church to do our first outreach mailer, we didn't have any money. And I had worked at Costco for almost 10 years. And so I had some money there and, and a retirement that they had put aside for me over those years. And I prayed about it. I, I felt like God said, give that away. Invest that into the lost. Invest that into this church. So I did. Nobody asked me to do that. Now, if I, some people have found out over the years that I've done that. And some people said, well, that was dumb. You know, but. I'm not going to listen to my critics. I know if I had taken a survey, what do you think? And take, uh, nobody's going to agree with that, right? They're going to say that's dumb. So you're going to have critics that speak into it. You just, you, you, and when you're in difficulties, you, you, you just got to say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow God. I, I trust God to do this. Moses had difficulty. He was leading people out of Egypt who were in bondage. He goes right into a desert, not right into the promised land. And then they're out of water. Next thing you know, they're out of food. Then they start having complainers and then poisonous snakes are around. I mean, just and problem after problem. You read Deuteronomy, you read Numbers, it's all these problems. They had difficulties during the delay. And the whole time, they're in part of God's will. I mean, they're, God called them out of that. They were on their way. And in the process of being right where God wants them, they're having difficulties. David was anointed king. You know what happened the next several years? He's being hunted down like a dog by Saul, trying to kill him. He's hiding in caves. He didn't like that. Joseph, he had a dream to be a great ruler. You know what happens after that? He had a delay. And not only a delay, he had difficulties. He's sold into slavery. Then he's falsely accused of rape. Then he's thrown into prison and languishes there and nobody even knows he's there. That's some delay. That's some pain. Noah, the difficulties he had building a floating zoo. Could you imagine the challenges that come with that? You know, he's thinking, well, what do I do with the termites? You know, you know, <laughs> well, may, should I put them near the aardvarks? I'm, you know, trying to figure all that out. 
Dreams come with difficulties. They come, and the difficulties come in the delays. <clears throat> Even when uh, Joshua was going into the promised land, because Moses took him up to the edge of the promised land, all through the wilderness, all out of Egypt, God says, now you get to bring him into the promised land. He, thought, he probably thought, this is great, I get the easy job. He starts to go into the promised land. A few verses later, it says there was giants in the land. There's giants in the land. You know what those guys are? They're like the Dwayne Johnsons, you know, the, the, the He-Men, you know, all these guys. Oh, great. Difficulties, even in the promised land. Here's why God allows it. Notice in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, it says, At present, you may be temporarily harassed by all kinds of trials. This is no accident. It happens to prove your faith, which is infinitely more valuable than gold, more valuable than anything we can think of, whatever gold can buy. It's your faith. That is what's most important. And God grows us in our faith through difficulties. This week I heard about a lady who uh, was here last Sunday. She's a member of our church. And uh, she was in quite a bit of financial difficulty. Her, she was, uh, her ex-husband, I guess she was getting certain payments that was helping pay for her mortgage and some of her bills. And that ended. She was here. We were, had the honor to try to help her. We were able to help her at the food pantry. We actually gave her a check for some money to help her. It wasn't enough to cover all of her expenses. It was too much. But we were able to help with some. And so she was still in this place of difficulty. She was sitting in the service last week as I was talking about grace and about trusting God and, and with our finances. And then I quoted that verse about how Jesus said that if God even cares for the birds of the air and that wouldn't he care for you? And she heard that and that had been her prayer. And right then she goes, I know God's going to take care of my needs. Right then she got a text from an uncle who said, I heard about your need. I'm going to cover all of your bills. She came back and gave the check back and said, I don't need this. I'm good to go. See, through our difficulties, it's in that place where our faith is proved. You know, what's, you know we, can, we can have, we can become... Uh, Unhappy, distrusting, angry, bitter, cynical. It's proving our faith. Because it's easy to walk around and have faith when everything's fine. Yeah, I'm filled with faith. Things are going well, but when things are tough, the Bible says that proves our faith. Number five, when you're in a tough spot, so you start with a dream, then decision, then a delay, then it's difficulty, and then you go, wow, this is... I've been in the difficulty so long, I don't see an, it, it's, there's an impasse now. I'm at a dead end, and that's, you don't give up at a dead end. You don't give up at a dead end. The situation deteriorates from difficult to impossible. There's a difference between a difficult marriage and an impossible marriage. That's true with our health. It's looked real bad, now I'm being told you know, it's stage four. Now I'm being told it's a dead end for me. My career is a dead end. My life is a dead end. When we're at a dead end, when you're in that place, it's, that's when the difficulty is at its absolute zenith. And um, there's good news actually with that. Good news is that you're not alone. You know, Many, many saints over the centuries have been in that situation. They've gone through. That's part of the way God builds our faith is through these stages. It's not like every, some people get, oh, well, you get exempt from that stage. You get to go through the other ones, but I love you so much. I'm not going to. No, every person, every Christ follower, person walking in faith, they go through this, including Paul. He writes about it. The apostle Paul says this. He's at a dead end. The real low point, we're kind of visiting Paul at this moment in a very low point in his life. He says, at that time, we were completely overwhelmed. Maybe you feel like that. The burden was more than I could bear. And he says, in fact, we told ourselves that this was the end. You now, yet now we believe that we had this sense of impending disaster so that we might what? Well, there it is again. Learn to trust. We're to grow in our faith. Not in ourselves, but in God, who can raise the dead. 
See, when Paul was in that place, he reminded himself, you know, God can raise the dead. And if he can raise somebody physically from the dead, then he can raise somebody emotionally from the dead. He can raise my marriage from the dead. He can raise a career from the dead. He can raise things that look impossible. He can, he can change the reality that I, that I see. A doctor's prognosis, no matter what it is. Abraham's situation was this. God had given him this promise years and years before. Now he's 99. He still has no child. He's supposed to be the father of a great nation. He looks at his body, he goes, no way. <laughs> then he looks at Sarah. She's 90. He goes, double no way. <laughs> it's not happening. I mean, look at how long. Why did God wait this long? And he just, I mean, he could have gone through all of that and did. And then when she gets pregnant, you know what her response is? She, she laughs. She laughs. Because it's just like, we know that she, she didn't even believe it was happening. Because a woman of her age who got pregnant, if she believed it, she would not laugh. She would cry, right? Like, oh, no. <laughs> Starting out. In fact, they named their child Isaac, which means laughter. Like, kid, you're a joke, man. I don't get it. <laughs> Dead end for them. God often lets those situations get to that place. The disciples, they were following the Messiah. He's crucified. They see it. And they're thinking, we were going to follow him, and we had all these plans. And for three days, you know, they didn't, they were at a dead end. And of course, Jesus raised from the dead. When that happens, we start to wonder, you know, what's going on? Did I miss it? Moses is a terrific example of being in a dead end. Moses is leading the people of Israel out of 400 years of slavery. He goes to, to uh, Pharaoh. Pharaoh doesn't want to let him go. Plague after plague, 10 plagues, finally says, get out of here. You know, good riddance, get out of here. And so they leave, the Israelites leave. They go all the way up to the Red Sea, and there's, there's no way past. Red Sea is uncrossable. They have mountains on either side. Pharaoh, just a day later, decides, you know what? I don't like those guys anyways. I'm going to go after them. He sends his armies after them. And now they're trapped. Red Sea in front of them an army that wants to kill him. I'm sure there's people that were going, Moses, you know, now we're going to die. I'd rather be in slavery than die. Here's a point to that. Some people would prefer bondage rather than risk taking for God. They'd rather just stay where they're at, even if it's miserable, even if they're in bondage rather than seeing what God would do in their life, trusting God, risk taking but what happens is you end up in God's cul-de-sac. And it's where he does his greatest works. You know where they were at, interestingly, was a place called Baal Zephon, which means God's hidden treasure. That's the place where they were at, where the Red Sea was in front of them and the mountains and Pharaoh was behind them with his armies. God's hidden, God was going to do something great. And we know the story. God opened the Red Sea, let the Israelites pass the held back the, the Pharaoh and his armies. And when they finally went, they were swallowed in the Red Sea. It became part of their story. Because our greatest stories are from these places when we're at a dead end. Greatest stories. I've had God move in my life in many, many ways. But my greatest stories are when I was at a dead end. You know, after we had miscarriage after miscarriage, and then our... Finally, Sharon gets pregnant. We carry it into a full term, and he's supposed to be stillborn. And then we're looking at in utero surgery and all of the, we're just, we're, we're, you know, you're up against the wall. It's a dead end. It's over. All the doctors are saying, you know, abort the child. There's, it's going to be a miserable day before he actually dies. He won't come out stillborn. And then God heals. It's the, those are the great, that, that's the greatest stories. They become God's greatest work in your life at the dead end. I want you to write this down. Dead ends are part of God's plan for me. Because sometimes we don't believe that. Sometimes I think in our American ide ideology is we think that life should be good, always. And that if there's anything bad, 
then somehow God's removed his blessing from us. Friends, I'm telling you, that is not the case. That, is not, that does not bear out in Scripture. God allows us to go through difficulties, and he allows us to go into a dead end. Now, what's the best response I can have in a dead end? Look at this, 2 Corinthians 1.10, when we expect God's deliverance, it says, he has delivered us, and he will deliver us again. He will, he's delivered us. You remind yourself of what God's done in the past, and he will deliver us again. Psalm 27, 13, I am expecting the Lord to rescue me again so that once again I will see his goodness to me. We approach it with faith, with positive expectation, reminding ourselves that God is faithful. Number six, expect your deliverance. You expect it. God, I know you're going to come through. I don't know when, but I know your timing is perfect. In Moses' case, God split the Red Sea. In Abraham's case, he gave him the child, the promised the, the promise child that he would build a great nation through. Joseph's case of having the dream to rule the nation, he ended up having his, another dream interpreted. Next thing you know, that happens for him. Jesus was resurrected. So we just expect God to act. The verse I began with is the verse I want to end with. Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done to you. That happens individually. It also happens as a church. You know, this church has gone through all of those stages. When we started this church, Sharon and I, 22 years ago, we had, an, we had a dream for a church, a church that we didn't, that didn't, we didn't see it in this area, a church that loved the lost, loved social justice, cared for the poor, was ethnically diverse, was generationally diverse. And we um, believed in that women could have uh, ministry opportunities equal to men. Not because we're liberal, but because we see that in Scripture. And we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but not in the, all the legalistic baggage that often comes with, with, with certain traditions. Just we listen without all that legalism, but embracing the gifts of the Spirit. God gave us a dream. And we knew it was God because we couldn't do it by ourselves. We needed God to come through in some great ways. And he did, oh, time and time again. But we had to make the decision, okay, let's go for it. And when we started, we had no people, no money. We had no, no, no facility, no possession. We started in our home, just in our garage. And then we moved to a school, and then we moved to another school, and then we moved to a movie theater, and we just, we were a transient church. And we made a decision, and, and that it cost security, and it also cost investment. And we had a number of people that came alongside and invested, gave their time, their money, their energy, laid it all down. But there was a delay. We've had delays in this church. We were in that transient place for seven years. Seven years of getting up at five in the morning, packing up the van, uh, other people packing up their cars with kids stuff, all kinds of stuff that you need to make a church work. We would all descend at a school or wherever we were renting. And we'd set up the sound system, set up the chair, clean up the place. It takes hours of work that went into it. And, and year after year, no facility. We couldn't afford it. We didn't have it. Some people said, you know what? I think that maybe God doesn't want us to have a facility. I'd say, that's not true. That is not at all. That's, we're in a delay. We're, we're in a delay. We, we're moving in our decision, but we're just in a delay and we're having diff some difficulties. It's hard. But God definitely wants us to have a facility. I didn't know when, I didn't know how, but I knew it was going to happen. Some people decided, well, I don't want to wait around for that. I don't, I don't see it. And some people stayed. Some of those people are you. You know, you, you made the decision, you persevered through the delay, through the difficulties, through things that look like no way. The dead ends when we needed three and a half million dollars to renovate this place. We thought, and we looked around, we did, we did a, we hired, three, we were gonna, we interviewed three capital campaign companies. They all flew in, looked at our records, and they said, well, we're highly successful. We're the top capital campaign people in the world in that nation. 
They go, we looked at it, they go, we, this is, we're not going to take your case. I said, but I'm willing to pay you to help us to raise this money. They said, we only take things that can work. Your church is too poor. They said, we, 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 and all three of them said, no, they wouldn't help us. Even though we were willing to pay them. They probably figured that's all the money we had and then it was done and they didn't feel right about that. God still used this church to, we raise that money and, and we raise more than we needed. That was a dead end. It was a, you know, you're looking, well, we need, how are we going to move forward? You expect God's deliverance. And some of you, you're in, you're in that, one of those places. Everybody here is somewhere in that place, in one of those stages. I want to pray for you, whichever stage you're at, that God will grow your face and release something new in your life. Would you stand with me and we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite you right now to come into this place. Grow our faith. Some of you need to say, God, help me with my unbelief. Because it can look pretty doggone scary in some of those stages. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. If you'd like to slip out and receive prayer, you can do that anytime while I'm praying. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who, who are stuck. They don't even have a dream. They're not sure about that. They're unclear. Listen, friends, if you don't know your purpose, if you don't have a dream that is drawing you, the world is happy to drive you. The world is happy to set the agenda for you. And it's not going to be God's best for you. So God, I pray that you deposit a great dream the great dream that you have for every person here. Help them to see it and move towards it, to make the decision to say, it's worth leaving things that I feel that give me security. Say, God, I'm willing. I ask you to pray this. Say, God, I'm willing to take a risk rather than to stay where I'm at in bondage. Some of you need to make a decision and it's a fundamental decision like putting your faith in Christ. Saying, God, I want to trust you. Help me to follow you. Help me to move towards you. Maybe you need to be baptized and that's your decision. Get involved in a local church that can help rally alongside you. Get involved in a small group. Maybe be part of this conference. If you were to really slow down and ask God, that's a, that could be kind of vulnerable, huh? Because we know what we want. And there's always a little fear God wants something different than what we want. I challenge you right now to just say, God, I'm setting my agenda aside. What do you want? Maybe you're in a delay. You've been praying about something for a while now. And you're asking, when, oh God, when? And then there's difficulties in the delay. Maybe you're there where there's you're just difficulty after difficulty, circumstances or critics coming at you. You have very little support, maybe none. Your test, you're a test, you're in a test. The University of Learning to Wait. God says, I'm proving your faith, refining you. Lord, I pray that everyone here would look towards you and say, God, I expect you to deliver me. I expect, I know you're faithful and I remind myself of how you've moved on my, or remind myself of how you've moved on me before. Do it again, oh Lord, do it again. In Jesus' name, amen.